Listen, our God is, he is awesome. And it is so great to have you here with us in uh, being able to, to worship, him, worship him together as, as we lift our voices, as, uh, as we uh, uh, hear a message, as, as we just respond to him and what he is doing in this moment in our lives. What, what a great time for us to, to be together and, and gather and, and share in just the incredibleness of, of who our God is. And whether this is your first time or honestly you're just part of the family, we are so glad to have you here. If it is your first time, there in the, in the pew rack, there's a, there's a little card. And if you'll fill that out, and as you leave uh, the, the sanctuary here today, if you'll take it to the info counter, they have a gift for you. And they'll just uh, be happy to, uh, to, to give that to you. But uh, as we get started here, I ask Pastor Dave, come on up. <clears throat> We consider it a privilege to worship our Lord and Savior this morning through song. And let me read a couple verses for you as we continue this morning. This is from 1 Corinthians 15. It says this, The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's celebrate the victory through Jesus this morning.
to life, I will sing your praise in the wonder of your grace. I see that Christ, I see free. close this time of worship. You come and kneel before your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You just lay your burdens at Him. So we close with this great old hymn, Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace How sweet the sound That saved a wretch like me was lost but now I'm found was blind but now I see t'was grace that taught my heart to fear and place my fear
the earth shall soon dissolve like snow the sun forbear to shine but God who called me here below will be forever will be But uh, I'll tell you what, what a great church uh, that we have here. And not only do we support uh, Camp Gideon, but honestly across uh, Eastern region, there's many initiatives that, that our, tr- our church has been very faithful in, in helping. And, and I just want you to know, you know what, the dollars that you give here in just a moment, listen, they are impacting lives here in this valley. But listen, they are impacting lives throughout the United States. They are impacting lives in our world. Uh, and so God is just really using this church and using you and your faithfulness uh, to really take his message uh, into our world. And so we're very thankful. I am very thankful to be a part of a church uh, that just uh, loves him and, uh, and a church that just uses that money so wisely uh, to really love others. And so I'll ask the ushers to come and take up our morning's author- offering. <laughs> When sin was as black as could be, Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt among men, my example is he. Word became flesh and my shine among us, his glory revealed. Living he loved me, dying he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day, oh glorious day. One day they led him up Calvary's mountain. One day they nailed him to die on a tree. Suffering anguish, despised and rejected. Bearing our sins, my Redeemer is he. Hems that healed nation stretched out on a tree. Took the nails for me. Living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. justified freely forever one day he's coming oh glorious day oh glorious day one day the grave could conceal him no longer one day the star rolled away from the door then he arose over death he had conquered now is ascended my lord evermore death could not hold him grave could not keep him rising again rising again Living, he loved me dying he saved me buried he carried my sins far away Rising, he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day, oh glorious day. Savior Jesus is mine. 
dying he saved me buried he carried my sins far away rising he justified freely forever one day he's coming oh glorious day oh glorious day Let me invite you to stand and I'll ask uh, Dave Frisch, friend and uh, elder of our Education Commission, to uh, read our scripture this morning for us. Dave? You may be seated. Hey, I'm not so good through. So what a great opportunity to be able to share from the Word of God with you today. Uh, those of you who might be visiting with us, uh, Pastor Jerry, our senior pastor, Jerry Winger, is actually in Israel right now. Uh, he hit 30 years of service here at East Richland Friends Church last year, and uh, the congregation decided to send him and Robin on a trip to the Holy Land. And so there was another eight folks from our church that wanted to go along with them, and they met up with a group of, I think, like 40 from Canton First Friends. And uh, so they're all over there. They left Friday. And uh, uh, so that's why Jerry's not here, and, and I'm taking advantage of that. I was having some problems problem with my mic pack last week. I've got Jerry's mic pack, and I tell you what, I can just feel the power flowing through this headset here. But they, uh, they sent us along a little greeting from Masada, and so I'm going to have the guys show you a greeting from Masada. Hello, Hello. 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 From Masada. Hello from Masada. <laughs> And uh, so that's a group from our church here that, uh, that went over there. This is, uh, I understand this is one of the uh, trolleys that they used to get uh, to their destination while they were in Masada. And apparently Masada is, if you look on a map of Israel over there, Masada is just off of the southwest corner of the Dead Sea. And so that's where they are today. They've got a full slate of things over the next week, week and a half. And so you'd be praying for them, praying for their safety as they're over there. Uh, what a wonderful thing. I imagine this is on a lot of your bucket list as it is on mine, and so maybe we'll take another trip over there someday. Well, I can't think of a better way to get started than with a word of prayer, so let's bow for prayer. <clears throat> Father, we, we thank you so much uh, for this church. We thank you so much for uh, our, our senior pastor, Jerry, and his family. Lord, we thank you for the leadership here, and we pray for your protection uh, over those folks as they're over in the Holy Land. Just help them to really, really experience you, uh, Lord, in a very unique way. Uh, while they're over there. Lord, keep them safe. Help them to grow closer to one another. Father, we'll miss them, but uh, we pray that you would guide and direct uh, us here in their absence. Father, we thank you that we can come before you in this country, having our Bibles open on our laps. Father, being able to sing praises to the true God, the God of the Bible. Lord, without soldiers and persecution at our doors. Father, we're grateful to you for the freedom that we have in this country yet today to do that. May we not May we not take that for granted. Father, I pray that as we spend some time looking in your word today, Lord, may we, be, we, may we be reminded that it is the inspired word of God, Lord, written by men through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Father, I pray that you'd help me to step out of the way of what you want to share with these folks today. I pray that you'd guide and direct every thought that comes into my mind, every word that comes out of my mouth. And Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit 
would take control of each and every one of us today, that, that your Holy Spirit would move in and out of these pews. Father, I pray that he would do a work of, of translation from what comes out of my mouth into the ears of these hearers. Father, that it would impact us, each of us, in such a way that we need to be impacted. Father, we want to tell you that we love you. We commit this time to you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, leading up to the Easter uh, Sunday and Palm Sunday, we are currently in a series talking about the last seven statements of Christ from the cross. And so Pastor Jerry has gotten through three of these. Let me remind you uh, here as a a brief um, review, the first statement that Jerry went over was, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing, from Luke 23. 34 had a great, uh, great message about forgiveness on that day. The second statement of Christ was, truly I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. From Luke 23, 43, as Jesus spoke these words to the robber hanging on the cross next to him. And last week, Pastor Jerry went over, woman, here is your son, here is your mother. From Luke 9, verses 26 to 27, as Jesus was taking care of those that he loved here physically on the earth. And today, As David just read for us, we're going to be taking a look at the statement, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? If you'd like to follow along and you don't have a paper Bible with you today, we have some in the pews. You can find this passage uh, in the pew Bibles on page 697 or on page 988, page 697 or page 988 if you'd like to follow along. The verses will be up on the screens today, but if you'd like to follow along, I encourage you to do that. Let's take a look at verse 45 again that, that Dave just read for us. Matthew 27, 45 says this, From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. And the first thing that we want to note in this passage, in the setting, we want to try to get your mind wrapped around what was going on, even environmentally, when Jesus was hanging on the cross, is we see the absence of light. Something very significant happened as Jesus was hanging on the cross, but we understand as we look through the timing that's recorded in the Gospels, Mark 15, 25 says this, it was nine in the morning when they crucified him. So Jesus was hung on the cross at 9 a.m. His persecution and suffering and trials had happened prior to that, but he was hanging on the cross at 9 a.m. And then we're told here that at noon, Darkness came over this next significant occurrence in the events of the passion of Jesus Christ was darkness. Now, what was the extent of the darkness? Now, in this verse, it says that darkness came over all of the land. And certainly God is powerful enough, wouldn't you agree, to cause darkness to fall over as little or as much of the world that he wants to at one time. As a matter of fact, remember this in Exodus chapter 10, verses 21 to 23. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward the sky so that darkness spreads over Egypt, darkness that can be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand toward the sky, and total darkness covered all Egypt for three days. No one could see anyone else or move about for three days. Yet all Israel had light in the places where they lived. Have you ever been in total darkness before? There are only a few places on earth where you can actually experience total darkness. And I believe I had the opportunity several years ago to visit one of those places. Has anybody ever been to Mammoth Caves, Kentucky? I don't know if any of you have ever been there. Yeah, it's it's an amazing place. If you ever get a chance, it's really not that far of a drive from here. It'd be a great weekend excursion. And in Mammoth Caves, they have all kinds of tours, miles and miles and miles of caves down there. You can go all the way from a simple walking tour to what they call a caving tour where you're wearing bump caps, lights and knee pads. I actually did this with a buddy of mine for four hours one time. It was amazing. But they have a tour that they call the historic tour, and it's a pretty light tour to walk on, but it takes a couple of hours, and they walk you through what the early explorers would have experienced as they were mapping out the caves and the caverns there in Mammoth Caves. And we get to a point when we're in this large room, and they have some benches, and everybody has a seat. And the tour guide's giving us some more history of what's going on in Mammoth Caves. And he says, now, folks, Folks, we're going to turn the lights out for just a few seconds because we want you to experience what the first explorers would have experienced as they were mapping out these caves. We're just going to leave them off for a few seconds and then we'll turn them back on. And so they hit the lights off. And I tell you what, 
if, if you could ever feel darkness, I tell you, you could feel darkness in there. You didn't have any lights from stars or the sky or a nearby city or anything. It was completely dark. And it really hit me that as, as we read in here about darkness falling across the land, the folks who would have been observing the crucifixion going on that day had to have taken note of what was going on because it was happening at noon. And so a simple lunar eclipse would not have been something that could have happened as a result. Uh, the darkness couldn't have happened as a result of the eclipse because this happened for three hours. Eclipses don't stay for three hours. They move through a process and they're over fairly quickly. Another thing that couldn't have happened uh, as a result of an eclipse that day was because the sun and the moon would not have been near each other at that time of the year. And so we know that this isn't something that just could have been explained by a possible natural occurrence. As a matter of fact, there are extra biblical writings that talked about the fact that darkness came across the entire earth that day. Writings outside of the Bible that talked about that day being full of darkness. And so what I want to do with you briefly here is talk to you about what was the cause of the darkness. It's recorded in Scripture. It's a significant thing that, that Matthew wrote about here. And why is this so significant? What was the cause of it? Well, we understand that there are some indications from Scripture that will help us grasp what was going on in the natural world during Jesus' crucifixion. And based upon the counsel of Scripture, we see that darkness with the indication of judgment of God on humanity. Darkness was an indication of the judgment of God on humanity. We see this at other points in Scripture. Take a look at Isaiah 13, verses 10 and 11. The stars of heaven and their constellations will not show their light. The rising sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. And here it is in verse 11. I will punish the world for its evil, the wicked for their sins. I will put an end to the arrogance of the haughty and will humble the pride of the ruthless. We see here this prophecy of darkness coming across the land because of evil and wickedness. How about Jude 6? It says this, And the angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their proper dwelling, these he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for the judgment on the great day. We see darkness in these just couple examples being an indication of the judgment of God upon the world. But here's the thing that I want to remind you of, is that John chapter 1 says that the true light came into this world. And now what we see as Jesus is hanging on the cross and darkness comes across the land, that this true light is now in the shadow of the darkness of the judgment of humanity. The very humanity that he was hanging on the cross to save. What a thing to contemplate this morning. So the bottom line that we see here is that even creation reacts to the judgment of God. Can you imagine being in that setting? Put yourself there in that place, the middle of the day when darkness came across the land. And this one was being crucified. How significant the darkness was. Let's move on down to verse 46. Verse 46. It says this, about three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We just saw the absence of light in this setting. And what we are experiencing here that's recorded is the abandonment of the Savior. We see that in this statement, in this this crazy environment in which Jesus was hanging. We see that he was abandoned by his father. And before we unpack this this morning, I, I want you to catch that this, that this moment is the moment that Jesus bore your sins and my sins. This was the moment, folks, when he took it upon himself. This is the most significant point. And it's important 
that you believe and understand what's going on here because your belief will affect your eternity. And so we see this. This was the pivotal moment of Jesus' punishment. We read about all of the punishment he had gone through prior to that, the slaps in the face, the, poking, the, the, the pulling of his beard, the, the crown of thorns, even the nails in his wrists and in his feet. But this, folks, was the pivotal moment of Jesus' punishment. And here's the thing. It's just hitting me right now. Jesus was on the cross, and you know what he did? He quoted Scripture. Boy, how many times do we get in situations in our lives and we do something other than that? Jesus was on the cross and he quoted a statement from Psalm 22, a psalm that David had written some thousand years before Jesus was hanging on the cross. This was a prophecy of what Jesus was going to go through at some point. So let's look at some of the parallels between Psalm 22 and Jesus' suffering here in the Gospels. Well, we've already read in verse 46 of Matthew 27, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But look at Psalm 22, verse 1. David records this, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? We see a connection between David and his enemies and Jesus and his enemies, causing them both to say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Take a look at Psalm 22, verse 7. Psalm 22, verse 7, David records this. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. Now, take a look at Matthew 27, 39, just a few verses ahead of where we are today. Matthew records those who pass by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads. And we see here a reaction of these enemies of David and the reaction of these enemies of Christ as he was hanging on the cross. How about Psalm twenty-two, sixteen? David says this, Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet. And then in John 20, 25, we read this. So the other disciples told him, talking to Thomas, we have seen the Lord, but he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And we see visual evidence of the scars of Jesus as a result of his crucifixion. David and Jesus both going through this, talking about this process of crucifixion. How about this? One more, verse 18 in Psalm 22. It's recorded, David says, they divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garments. Look at John 19, verses 23 and 24. What a very specific prophecy here. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled that said, they divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. So this is what the soldiers did. See the connection between the human world and David as he was writing this and Jesus and the spiritual sacrifice that he was making. Robert Godfrey says it this way, Jesus knew this psalm and quoted its first words to identify with us in our suffering since he bore on the cross our agony and suffering. Jesus, by making this statement, was saying, I am identifying with humanity in what I am doing right now. Folks, we have to grasp that this morning because if it weren't for Jesus' humanity, we would have no reason for hope here today. Another indication of the great depth of love that Jesus has for us. We see one quote of Jesus from a 1,000-year-old psalm that prophesied his suffering. But as horrific as Jesus' suffering was at this time, so much more difficult was the abandonment of his father. And I want you to catch this morning that this is the true weight of sin. Abandonment and separation. Abandonment and separation are the true weight of sin that Jesus felt on the cross, that Jesus carried on the cross for you and for me. How did this happen, this forsaking, this abandoning? 
What did this look, look like? First of all, I want you to understand that this abandonment was necessary. And here is why. Look at Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 13. This quote is from the New American Standard Bible. It says this way, Your eyes, talking to God, your eyes are too pure to approve evil. You cannot look on wickedness with favor. And I want you to catch this this morning. The indication of Jesus' calling out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me, was this. The turning away from the Father, of the Father from the Son, is proof that Jesus indeed bore our sins. Right there in that statement, there's proof that Jesus, if you've ever wondered, could, could he do that for me? Did he do that for me? The answer is yes, because his father cannot look on the sin that he bore at that moment. Jesus was forsaken. John MacArthur says it this way, Jesus did not die as a martyr or a, a righteous cause or simply as an innocent man wrongly accused and condemned, nor as some suggest did he die as a heroic gesture against man's inhumanity to man. The Father could have looked favorably on such selfless deaths as those, but because Jesus died as a substitute sacrifice for the sins of the world, the righteous heavenly Father had to judge him fully according to that sin. Just because he was Jesus, God the Father did not withhold some of his judgment from him. Folks, because the payment had to be made, a payment that you and I could not have made. And so here's what Jesus did. It's recorded in Isaiah 53. Some of you are familiar with these verses. Listen to these verses, four and five. It says this, Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. This is a description of what Jesus went through for you and for me. And we read in that description that he was pierced and that he was crushed. You see, Jesus was literally pierced, not only through his wrists and through his feet as he hung on the cross, but scripture records that after his death, a soldier drove a spear into his side, and that is another time that Jesus was pierced. And here's what scripture records. When he did that, both blood and water flowed out. So from a medical standpoint, here's what happened. When, when Jesus was pierced by that spear, that spear actually broke open. It cut the pericardium, which is the sac around the heart. That pericardium had filled with water, and that's why we see blood and water flowing out of the side of Jesus. And so, from a medical description, we understand that Jesus had pericarditis, inflammation of that sac around his heart. We just talked about how the fact that he was pierced in his hands and in his side and in his feet. But did you realize that Jesus' heart was crushed? As he hung there on that cross, the pressure built up against his heart, and his heart was literally crushed. Now, do you believe he did that for you? I believe he did it for me. And sometimes I say, how could you? How could you do that for me? But I'm reminded over and over and over again in Scripture that it is because of his great love. Have you realized that great love in your life? That great love that can change your eternity? Truly Jesus was pierced, and truly Jesus was crushed. And these verses tell us that Jesus had to endure the suffering because of our transgressions, because of our iniquities. And Paul records in 2 Corinthians 5.21 this statement, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And I want to be clear with you this morning. At no point when Jesus was bearing the weight of your sin and my sin, did he ever sin? Because if he did, he would no longer have been a suitable sacrifice for you and for me. 
This verse says that he became sin for us. What we're talking about here, folks, is substitution. Jesus took your place on the cross. He took your place in what he experienced that day that you might not have to. Jesus' sacrifice was received by God the Father as a substitution for you. You see, your sin and my sin were taken off of our account and placed upon Jesus' account where he paid for it at the cross. And you know what else happened? Is that the righteousness of Jesus was taken from his account and placed upon my account, placed upon your account, that which I don't deserve except for his great love for me. And so now no longer do I have to make that payment for my sin, but I have an opportunity through a relationship with Jesus to be the righteousness of God through Christ. That's why we're here today. That's the message that should be on our lips when we're not here. People should know this. Jesus bore the guilt of the sin of humanity, past, present, and future. And we read this in Galatians 3.13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a pole, who hangs on a tree. The perfect God-man, fully God and fully man, became sin for us, became a curse for us, because all of that was upon us prior to that. Jesus became cursed and bore the weight of our guilt. Folks, it was the guiltless for the guilty. He was our substitution. And I want you to understand this fully this morning. Abandonment means that Jesus faced bearing the weight of your sin all by himself. That's what that statement is. When Jesus bore your sin and he bore my sin, he was by himself because not even his own father could look on him at that point. For that moment, he lost fellowship with his father. Never did he cease being God, but he lost fellowship with his father. And yet even more significant was that Jesus not only bore the guilt and the weight of our sin, but he bore the fullness of the wrath of God. Wayne Grudem says it this way, as Jesus bore the guilt of our sins alone, God the Father, the mighty creator, the Lord of the universe, poured out on Jesus the fury of his wrath. Jesus became the object of the intense hatred of sin and vengeance against sin. God's only beloved son became the object, the pinpoint of the hatred of God against sin at that moment on the cross alone. He did that for me. He did that for you. Let's take a look at the last few verses of this passage today, beginning in verse 47. When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge and filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And so, in this setting, we see the absence of light, the abandonment of the Savior, and now we see this abuse from the crowd all around him. In the midst of the environment in which they found themselves, many of those witnessing Christ's crucifixion were distracted from the reality of what was happening as they mocked him. Did you catch the mocking tone? Oh, he's calling for Elijah. These people would have known exactly what Jesus just said. Hold on, hold on. Let's let's see if Elijah comes and, and saves him. Upon hearing Christ cry and keeping with the nature of their mocking, 
They proclaimed these statements about Elijah because they had just heard him say this back up in verse 43 in Matthew 27 where it says, he trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him for he said, I am the son of God. Based upon what Jesus had claimed, they were mocking him. Even in the very presence of their savior, they denied who he was. Folks, does that happen today? Do you realize that the very presence of the Savior is here with us today through the Holy Spirit? I hope you believe that because it's true. Are there any who deny who he is? We certainly know in the world today, many deny who the Bible says Jesus was and is. What about the sponge? was filled with this wine vinegar. It was likely the response of a Roman military guard who brought diluted wine to a thirsty Jesus. We're told about this in John 19.29, where John says, a jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. I thirst is the next statement that Jesus makes from the cross. This is what we're going to look at next week. The humanity of Jesus Christ. The crowd, in their sarcasm, desired the humiliation and torture of Jesus. Despite all of these environmental conditions, the cry of the Savior, the brief showing of mercy with a wet sponge, the crowd's desire was to make Jesus' death as cruel and as humiliating as they could. And you know what? There's nothing that the crowd could have done that would have hold, held a candle to the abandonment that he felt when his father turned away from him. You see, without a true understanding of who Christ is and what he has done, we will most certainly be looking for salvation in the wrong places. My desire for you this morning is that the Holy Spirit will give you a clear understanding about this, about this bottom line, that Jesus carried the weight of your sin so that you might not be separated from him for eternity. Jesus carried the weight of your sin and my sin so that we might not be separated from him for eternity. Jesus went through a time of separation and abandonment and forsaking and being alone so that you and I would not have to for eternity. Look at Romans 10, verses 1 through 3. Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved, for I can testify about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based upon knowledge, since they did not know the righteousness of God and sought to establish their own. They did not submit to God's righteousness. And folks, I want to remind you this morning, you can know all you want to know about God. by putting that knowledge into practice, by putting the full weight of your trust in Christ alone for your eternal salvation is the only thing that's gonna change your eternity. You know what, there are a lot of people out there that know a lot more about the Bible than I do. But that knowledge hasn't saved them if they haven't surrendered their life to Jesus Christ. You see, you and I cannot come up with a way to eternal life because in trying to, We not only guarantee our eternal death, but we also pervert the sacrifice of Christ that we have been looking at this morning. The abandonment by the Father was the pinnacle of Christ's suffering. Separation from his Father was excruciating, but Scripture tells us that fellowship between the Father and the Son was restored. You know what? Peter tells us in his great sermon in Acts chapter 2 that where Jesus is right now, 
You know where Jesus is? He's sitting at the right hand of his Father in heaven right now. Fellowship was restored, and that is his desire for you and for me, is that sin which separates us from fellowship with our Creator has been paid for through Jesus Christ that we might once again be able to have fellowship with him. That's what he's calling us to through this suffering on the cross. I want to be clear with you this morning. The Bible teaches that the destination of those who are not in a right standing with Christ now is a lake of fire. But make no mistake, you've heard me say this before, I am convinced that the worst part about an eternity in hell is not the heat. It is knowing that a sovereign God does exist and being separated from him forever and ever and ever. You see, folks, I'm convinced that separation for eternity is the torture of hell. And I am not here trying to scare you this morning. I am simply telling you what the truth of the Bible has to say, why Jesus said what he said here on the cross at this time, making the payment that he did for us And remember, Jesus went through the loneliness of separation so that you and I don't have to. And my question for you this morning is this. What are you going to do about it? Let's stand. Father, as we stand here this morning I know this is kind of heavy but it's what your word says Father what Jesus did on the cross is nothing to take lightly what Jesus did on the cross impacts the eternity of each person standing in here today what Jesus did on the cross demonstrates the immense and intense love that you have for us Father, I pray this morning that if somebody here today has not given their life to you through your son Jesus, that today would be the day that you would impact their eternity. Father, I thank you for the truth of your word. I thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus through whom I know I will be with you for eternity. And I want that for everyone in this room. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, we're going to sing for just a minute. And some of you are here today, and you're saying, you know what, I know Jesus. Praise the Lord. I am so happy about that, that you know Jesus. But perhaps today you realize that the life you've been living has not been a tribute to the sacrifice that he made on the cross. Do you have something that needs to be handled today? We're going to open up the altar again. If you need to come down and settle something today in light of what Jesus did for you, make that day today. And if you don't know Jesus, I want to introduce you to him today. I know this is a lot of people to come, out, come down in front of. But I tell you what, any discomfort that you might feel today by coming down in front of these will not hold a candle to the discomfort for eternity without him. Folks, if God is calling you through his Holy Spirit to make a decision today, come as we sing. Take all my have in these hands and multiply, God, all that I am and find my heart. On the altar again, set me on fire, set me on fire. Take all I have in these hands and multiply, God, all that I am and find my heart on the altar again. Set me on fire, set me on fire. Here I am.
several years ago, my grandfather, who passed away about a year ago, had neck surgery. He was struggling with some pain and numbness in his hands and in his arms. And I went to visit him as he was recovering in the hospital bed, probably close to 80 years old when this happened. He was laying there in a lot of pain. A few times he would groan. He said this, you know, Dave, I'm laying here in a lot of pain. But I can hear God telling me, the pain that you feel right now is nothing like what I did for you on the cross. What an amazing testimony. And I'm sharing that testimony with you this morning. That he loves you that much. Whether you believe it or not, he does. I want to encourage you to call out to him. Call out to him for everything. Father, we thank you. We thank you that we can process this most important of sacrifices 2,000 years ago that is just as applicable to us today as it was then. Father, I pray that you would allow these folks today, when they lay their head on their pillow tonight, that they would be unsettled. Father, that it would stir them to either draw closer to you in a relationship, Lord, or come to you for the first time ever in a relationship. Father, by your Holy Spirit, please convince and convict because that's not my duty here today. Draw us to you, Father, that we might draw others to you. I pray for all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm dismissed.